In late September 2024, a team of researchers at the University of Barcelona in Spain calculated that during the last decade or so, the world's largest island, Greenland, has on average been losing about 300 billion tonnes of ice a year from its vast land-based ice sheet. And in its two meltiest years, 2012 and 2019, that number was more like 600 billion tonnes. But the mass of the entire ice sheet turns out to be something like 2.7 quadrillion tonnes. So at an average of 300 billion tonnes of ice loss a year, it'd take about 9,000 years for the whole thing to give way. That's no reason for complacency though, of course. Our scientists tell us that if we don't get a grip on the climate emergency, then temperatures will continue to rise and the Greenland ice sheet melt will accelerate dramatically to the point where it may all be gone within only a thousand years, leading to a global sea level rise of more than seven meters. Thousand years still too far away to bother you? Well, how about something a bit closer to home then? Hundreds of billions of tons of land-based ice going into the water every year is making a region of the North Atlantic less salty. And that, combined with some other climate-related phenomena, is causing the famous Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC, to slow down. The last time I took a look at this science of that mechanism, only about two years ago, the consensus seemed to be that the AMOC would be still going strong throughout the rest of this century. But the very latest research is suggesting the system might collapse as early as 2037, or only 12 years from now. And in those circumstances, to paraphrase Rudyard Kipling, if you can keep your head while all those around you are losing theirs, then you probably haven't understood the seriousness of the situation. Hello, and welcome to Just Have a Think. In really just the last two or three years or so, oceanographers and climate modelers have come to realize that the models themselves that predict ocean tipping points have been critically underestimating the myriad variables involved and overestimating the length of time it'll take for those events to occur. Now, for full transparency, I should say that the research I mentioned right at the start of this video has not yet fully completed the peer review process, so we need to be a little cautious about its findings. But it comes on the back of previous work from the same institution that was fully peer reviewed and published in Science Advances in February 2024. And there have been other significant research papers and articles published in the last 12 months or so that are worth cross-referencing as well. So squeezing all that into a 15 minute video has been a bit of a challenge folks, I must admit. It was a task made much easier though by a recent web chat with marine and atmospheric researcher at the University of Utrecht, René van Westen, who was the co-author of a couple of the papers I just mentioned. Let's start by clearing up the often muddled language in the mainstream media when it comes to systems like the Gulf Stream, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC, and the Global Thermohaline Circulation. So the AMOC is the large-scale ocean circulation, uh, which is covering the entire Atlantic Ocean. So it's both the upper ocean, but also the deep ocean. And I usually refer to uh, the conveyor belt in the Atlantic Ocean. And the Gulf Stream is only a very small part of this, uh, of this conveyor belt. It's only near the surface and near Florida. This is, of course, very important uh, because the climate in northwestern Europe is relatively mild due to the influence of the Gulf Stream. As the Gulf Stream moves across the Atlantic, it gradually loses heat to the atmosphere through evaporation. That leaves behind cooler and more salty water, which eventually hits the fresher waters of the North Atlantic. And because it's saltier and therefore denser than the fresh water, it sinks and joins the deep sea conveyor belt of the AMOC system, which in turn forms part of the global thermohaline circulatory system. It turns out that the AMOC system has collapsed on multiple occasions over the vast timeline of Earth's geological history. So uh, first of all, um, when we look at the past climate, so really from the last ice age and before that, we have this so-called Danskart Usher events, and that were due to natural variability in the climate system, then the AMOC transitions between two different states. Um, but keep in mind that the climate had a completely different configuration because there were ice sheets on Europe, there were ice sheets on the North American continent, so making it much more complex. Uh, and now we have uh, climate change, which is now mainly forcing the AMOC. But the main tipping mechanism, that is the so-called salt infection feedback, that is the accumulation of fresh water in the North Atlantic Ocean, that is eventually triggering an AMOC tipping event. And those mechanisms are still similar between the past climates and the present day climates. But how the AMOC is exactly forced, there are some subtle differences between them. 
The challenge for the model is, is to winkle out all those subtleties and complex variables and make sure they're all accurately factored into the physics that drives the calculations that the supercomputers crunch through to produce projections of likely future outcomes. Previous estimates of when and how likely an AMOC shutdown may occur have been based on conceptual models and statistical analyses of what the climatologists call proxy data. That methodology appears to have been underestimating the rate of change in our ocean systems. This latest research relied on so-called reanalysis of observational data. Yeah, so reanalysis data is data which is assimilated from observations, which is then put in into a climate model. Uh, and that can say something about the state of the system. Uh, so it is actually, um, it, it is some kind of observational data set, but you can imagine that we don't have all the data available. So what the reanalysis data actually does, it takes all the observations and then the model is steered towards these observations. So it fills in the gaps in between. And that makes it very useful to make these reconstructions from past climates as well or past climates from climates of the historical period, so from 8015 up to present day. Um, and then you can say something uh, about long-term trends uh, or whether we are going into the direction of a tipping point, yes or no. Now, you might think that if you want to establish what's really happening up in the North Atlantic, you should be taking all your measurements up in the North Atlantic, wouldn't you? But that convention was challenged as long ago as 1996 by climatologist Stefan Ramsdorf from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. Ramsdorf and his team proposed back then that it might be more effective to measure the salinity of the water at the southern boundary of the Atlantic Ocean, where it meets and interacts with other circulatory systems. And what uh, Stephen Ramsdorf proposed is that the salt advection feedback, uh, so that is the destabilizing mechanism which happens in the north, you can measure that at the 34 south boundary. And you can imagine this, like, imagine that you have your North Atlantic Ocean, which is a basin, um, and it has some interactions, and it needs to conserve its total freshwater or salinity budget. And in the north, there is no that much leakage going out of the North Atlantic Ocean. So therefore, if you want to see what is going on, how much salinity is flowing in or out of the Atlantic Ocean, you need to do that at the most relevant boundary, and that is at the southern boundary. So measuring it at 34 south is really important in finding a potential AMOC collapse. Now, of course, what you and I and most other folks want from experts like René and Ramsdorf and their colleagues is some concrete dates on when we can expect tipping points like the collapsing AMOC to happen. But of course, real life isn't so clear cut, is it? And as we all know only too well, predicting the future is a very precarious business indeed. So scientists quite rightly have to provide a range of uncertainty in their projections. And that principle applies here as well. So for example, we've got a paper published in July 2023 that suggests a collapse could happen anywhere between 2025, which at the time of posting this video is only three months away, right through to 2095. Then we have René's peer-reviewed paper from February 2024 that highlights the inaccuracies of the so-called coupled model intercomparison project or CMIP, and strongly suggests the underestimations of timelines that I mentioned earlier, without providing a specific range of possibilities. And then we've got this latest paper suggesting a 10% chance of an AMOC tipping point occurring as soon as 2037, a better than even chance of it happening before mid-century, and a 90% chance of it happening by around the 2060s. These all might seem like very wide margins, but on a geological timescale, they're no more than a blink of an eye. What these most recent papers do all seem to be at odds with, though, are the conclusions in the sixth climate assessment published by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, in 2023. Um, so, uh, so the IPCC report, um, based, of course, their findings from the CIMIP-6 models. And there is, uh, with the CIMIP-6 models, there is this very persistent model bias. And what actually happens is that the salinity budget is quite off. Uh, actually resulting in a too stable AMOC. And this originates from the fact that the AMOC is always tuned in these kind of models because you plug in a lot of physics, of course, but in the end, you need always to parameterize some aspects of your climate model. And in this tuning to get your correct AMOC strength, they lose the correct stability. So their AMOC is way too stable under both freshwater perturbations and also climate change. 
meaning that they don't show any potential AMO collapse under future climate change. So, okay, we've got models that disagree and timeline ranges that vary from one research paper to another. But let's work on the premise that a tipping point is on its way in the not too distant future. The next obvious question that you and I might ask is, why should we care about changes in systems way out in the ocean anyway? I, th I think I think this is a very valid comment because in the end, uh, you see a lot of news uh, regarding the AMOC and the AMOC impacts. So when we will trigger the AMOC tipping event in the future, so we don't know when this happens, but when this happens, the AMOC starts to decline. And we've seen acceler acceleration in its decline. And this takes about 100 years to go from the current state to a collapse state. And over this 100-year period, the global climate starts to shift. The AMOC actually carries a lot of heat towards northwestern Europe. And without this heat transport, northwestern Europe cools quite dramatically. Uh, and this can be uh, up to 10 degrees Celsius in some regions for northwestern Europe. Um, if you consider particular months, for example, the February months, it can go down to minus 40 degrees Celsius over a 100-year period. So that is really spectacular, but also very worrying, of course. You also get a shift in your tropical rain bands. Uh, and in particular, what was very interesting was the Amazon rainforest region, where you saw that the seasonality completely swapped around, meaning that the wet season became the dry season and vice versa. Um, so these are, of course, from a physical point of view, very fascinating and spectacular, but from a societal point of view, they are very worrying because society cannot adapt to such rapid changes because 100 years may sound like a very long time, but for typical cl climate timescales, but also on societal timescales, it's very hard to adapt. We are already having trouble adapting to the current climate change of about 0.2 degrees Celsius warming per, uh, per 10 years, per decade. And then only for Northwestern Europe, you can see some regional cooling while the global mean surface temperature increased by about two degrees Celsius. Um, but this gives these very big temperature contrasts. On the one hand, you're getting very cold winters, but the summer temperatures are still uh, substantially higher. So the, the seasonality increases for Northwestern Europe. A potential or an AMO collapse also gives one meter of sea level rise in the North Atlantic Ocean. Um, yeah, I read that. I read. I read sea level rise, or I think I heard Stefan Ramsdorf say it at a recent a recent event, and I couldn't quite understand why that that happened. So, if you can explain that, that would be very helpful. Yeah. So, um, if you if you go, uh, you're located, of course, in the UK, and if you yeah. uh, if you go to the sea, it looks like a flat a flat surface, right? But actually, there are a lot of slopes, but they are stretched like over 100 kilometers, so you don't see a very big slope of, across the Atlantic Ocean. But there is this substantial slope, um, and this slope is linked to the uh, to the current strength. Um, and right. if this current or the strength of the circulation collapses or reverses, then also the slopes need to adjust. And this adjustment of these of these slopes uh, across the ocean surface that gives this additional uh, sea level rise of one meter. So actually the sea level is redistributed across the globe. So only looking at temperature is simply uh, just rushing through all the results and just only selecting a temperature while you also need to consider precipitation, sea ice, uh, winter storms, uh, more extremes, uh, sea level, additional sea level rise due to an AMO collapse. So the list goes on and on. And that is only for Northwestern Europe. Then also take a look, for example, at the Amazon rainforest, where you see this shift. Uh, the Southern Hemisphere starts to warm even faster under an AMO collapse, triggering more melt uh, over Antarctica, destabilizing the ice sheet over there. All these consequences were discussed at some length by Stefan Ramsdorf and Princeton Professor of Geosciences and International Affairs, Michael Oppenheimer, at a recent New York Times event that I've linked down in the description section below. Towards the end of that debate, Oppenheimer offers us a typically pithy conclusion. We're marching into the next 30 years, a period over which it almost doesn't matter how much we reduce emissions, we're gonna get the same increase in short-term impacts, record heat, too much rain and rainstorms, probable intensification of hurricanes, etc. You've heard the list. And, you know, we don't have a plan. 
We've got to cut emissions as quickly as is feasible. We're not doing that. We could do better. We're doing better than we used to. And we've got to get equally important a program together to get uh, to deal with these impacts that are going to happen no matter what we do on the emission side over the next few years. As usual, it's poorer people in poorer countries uh, that take it in the neck mostly for, from things like this, but not it'll it'll affect us too in a significant way. Now, I'm sure many of you will have very strong views on how the science of climate change is developing and what the best course of action should be in the coming decades. And I'm always interested to hear those opinions. So as always, the place to leave your thoughts is in the comment section below. Anyway, that's it for this week. Thanks as always to the amazing folks who support my work over at Patreon. And I must just give a quick shout out to some folks who joined recently with pledges of $10 or more a month. They are Nick Schrombeck, Kieran Kavanagh, Mike Jackson, Marcus Bossard, Tim Camilleri, Chris Precious, Rob, Doug Eltoft, Arthur Pemberton, and Daniel Wallstrom. Don't forget to jump over to patreon.com forward slash just have a think to find out how you can join them and have a look at all the exclusive perks you can enjoy there. And if you found this video useful and informative, then you can hugely support me absolutely for free by hitting the like and subscribe buttons on YouTube and clicking all notifications. It doesn't cost a penny to do that, and it's just a simple click away, either down there somewhere or on that icon there. As always, thanks very much for watching. Have a great week if you can. And remember to just have a think. See you next week.